Hello. It's far too early on the first day of the year because who needs a lion? Oh, and who needs a light beam? <laughs> anyway, I have got a plan to kickstart my year of reading in what is a really fun and healthy way. 100% promise. Um, I'm going to read the 10 shortest books on my TBR. Why? It seemed like a really good idea at the time. So books I'm thinking of reading are um, some of these 404 Inklings books. Um, so we've got They Came to Slay the Queer Culture of D&D &D by Tom James Carter. We've got No Dice, Gambling and Risk in Modern Culture by Nathan Charles. And the appendix, Transmasculine Joy in a Transphobic Culture by Liam Corneman. We have got a classic passing by Nella Larson, which is about um, a middle class black family living in Harlem in the past. And it talks about, obviously, the concept of passing and about colorism within African American society um, and the consequences of that by the sounds of it. So, um, you know, just like light reading to start the year. Then I've got an absolute pile of charcoal press books that I want to try and get to because they're all very short, very stunning. Charcoal Press is an independent publisher based in Edinburgh who translate predominantly South American lit. Um, and it's the reason now why I think I've read more South American lit than Japanese lit, which at one time, mind-blowing. Um, so I'd like to read Selva Almada's Dead Girls, translated by Annie McDermott, which is a kind of fictionalised, non-fiction look at three murders of women in the author's childhood. Multi-award winning, we know who she is. It's Claudia Pinero's Elena Knows, translated by Frances Riddle. Apparently a crime novel, it's not really a crime novel. That's why I'm willing to give it a try. Another Selva Almada, this bitch wrote the Brickmakers that I read last year. And I am incapacitated. Um, so The Wind That Lays Waste is translated by Chris Andrews. Um, not a clue what it's about. I would read anything by Salva Almada at this point. And A Perfect Cemetery by Federico Falco, uh, translated by Jennifer Croft, is about a man who designs uh, cemeteries, like it says on the tin. Blood and Guts in High School by Kathy Acker. I had no idea I owned this book. I think Jesse might have bought it at some point. All I know is apparently it's a bit punk, and it's a bit sexy, and set in high school. <laughs> and the last book, I am, I am going to read it. I don't know where I've put it. It's just vanished. I had it ready to film. Um, hopefully I find it in time to read it. But it's Lolly Willows by Sylvia Townshead Warner. Um, classic, witchy. The woman abandons her family to romp in the moors. I've been trying to read this for so long and I'm determined, determined it's going to happen this time. It's going to happen. Let's go read some bloody books. I really should have said, like, for this vlog, don't expect anything other than them. The best duty in the world! Uh, so since it's the one I was actually gifted, I thought I'd start with No Dice, which is a really interesting look at gambling through, especially, video games, um, in-app transactions, things like that, and how dissimilar that is from a mindset like the lottery, which a lot of people don't consider gambling, but I definitely do. The lottery is a cabal, and it's a fucking conspiracy. Conspiracy, and it's gambling. <laughs> Sorry. It's interesting because it mentions a couple of games that, like, obviously I've heard of, but more than that, it introduces a concept of soft gambling and gambling that we don't really perceive as gambling, like children swapping Pokemon cards, like um, deciding if we should take a risk on a new streaming service. Should we put in, like, seven or eight quid a month when we don't really know what we're going to get and if we're going to enjoy anything that's on there? And also, it has a really personal experience of someone who wouldn't call themselves a gambling addict, but through the use of kind of government online questionnaires, risk questionnaires, they kind of come to terms with something over the course of writing this book. I think I'm just gonna hop straight on into the D&D one. Obviously the D&D one. D&D became a massive part of my life last year, the year before, so it feels right to be starting this year with a little bit of D&D inspired work.
we're getting on in the day and I have finished another book. Um, this was kind of an exploration of um, how D&D began, how it gained popularity and the recent resurgence of D&D, especially through COVID and how the digitisation of D&D during lockdown made it more accessible to chronically online people like queers. <laughs> but it also really talked about how even before this new boom of D&D, a lot of queer people were playing this game. It was already kind of acknowledged that the fan base was hella gay. Two for two. Oh, I've not been given these ratings. Um, I'm going to say four, high four for No Dice. High three for We Came to Slay. Because, like, yes, it was really well worded, but it just kind of reflected myself back to me. I was the echo chamber, and that's on me. So now... To read some more queer goodness, the appendix, which I think, if I understand it right, it is like a list that this author already kept of instances of transphobia. <laughs> so we're gonna go from radical queer joy straight into queer trauma. We love the whiplash! No, 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 no. Let me read you this quote. This body is transcendent. I had to walk through the realms to get it. This was kind of a pet project the author started, hoping to kind of <laughs> almost prove that it wasn't as bad as they thought. They weren't being crazy. They weren't seeing transphobia at every turn. There was only a few instances they could document. Plot twist, they live in the UK. And we are in a hell pit. Uh, at the moment for trans rights and just general society's attitudes towards trans people it mm, mm, we're in a bad place right now um but this was a really interesting way to look at someone's journey to queer euphoria so again we reach that queer joy that queer transcendence and honestly 2023 is the year that we don't let anyone tell us no. Did I mention it was five stars? Because clearly it's five stars. Oh, baby. Yes, it's the end of day two. Yes, we're in the same Udi. No, we're not going to talk about it. This was important. It has long been known that mean American classics do not mix whatsoever. Um, just, it's a vibe that I don't buy into. I don't know why. Literally any American could have written a book before the last 20 years. And I'd hate it. I just <laughs> don't understand. Um, I didn't hate this. I think it was really important and it really eloquently brought up a lot of things. Obviously I, as a white person, will not ever fully understand but it kind of set the stage of a real tension of some known someone who is passing and what that does to them and what they stand to lose it was weirdly stressful it almost felt kind of like a bit psychological in the way it kind of got its hooks into me um and i did tear through it despite kind of you know always thinking eh, it's american it was a really good read and I definitely recommend it. Um, and obviously I don't think it's supposed to be a read that you do enjoy. Really? So I am really conscious of like not wearing myself out through this process. But um, I think I'm going to start The Wind That Lays Waste tonight. I don't think I'm going to finish it. It's really short, obviously. But um, yeah, maybe just dip in. Just so I've got something to hit the ground running with tomorrow. Yeah. Oh my god, I accidentally finished it. <laughs> when I've read five books oh my god um yeah so what happened was it was real good and real quick um so we're following a girl in like the 80s who is sitting in the back of her dad's car because he's a traveling preacher um and you kind of unpick that relationship little by little um as they come across a garage because their car's broken down and the way this preacher reacts to the garage owner's son and the contrast therein of how he reacts to his daughter. 
I hate men. I hate men. It has been <laughs> an emotionally trying day. Can you hear that creak in my voice? <clears throat> it's not the cold, it's tears. Um, I made the mistake of trying to read two charcoals today and succeeding. So, <laughs> rather than just sitting here making faces, let me tell you about this one. This is Elena Knows by Claudia Pinero. It's translated by Francis Riddle. Won every award going and I can now totally, totally understand why. We follow hour by hour a little old lady as she tries to get across Buenos Aires to find someone who she met 10, 20 years ago, a long ass time ago, because she believes her daughter didn't commit suicide, she was murdered, and she needs to find an able-bodied person who owes her a debt to go out and investigate this murder. And <laughs> Because she suffers from Parkinson's disease, she can't allow herself to trust in her body enough to go out and investigate. She has to take a pill every hour without which she completely loses the function and control of her body. And it's told between doses. While she's performing these actions that for most people would be very easy day-to-day -day tasks, we're seeing through her memories how she got to this point. We're seeing her relationship with her daughter. We're seeing how communication between her and the police fell apart. How, ca how can we talk about this without revealing the plot twist of the crime book. Um, she thinks the lady that she goes to find would be happy to see her, overjoyed to do her this forever, because she stopped her doing something once, which she might have regretted. So she genuinely believes that in stopping this woman having her bodily autonomy, she did her a favour. And she goes to her and tries to cash in this favour whilst being imprisoned in her own body by an illness and she cannot see the parallel it's stunning and i have never felt a cold smile spread over my face as i whisper good for her with so much power as i did reading this honestly me given the crime book five stars uh, but five stars it was. So then I was like, oh god, Charcoal Press could do me no wrong. Let's start another one immediately, which we did. Dead Girls by Selva Almada, um, translated by Annie McDermott. When I was at uni doing creative writing, people would talk about like, creative non-fiction. And I'd be like, what the fuck does that mean? Get your head out of your ass and stop writing about Marilyn Monroe. Let the woman rest. But this is a fictionalised account of Almada's, I guess, childhood, early womanhood, coming to terms with the fact that every man in her life could do her fatal violence. Um, it really evokes the sense of her childhood, where she grew up, the people in her communities and kind of how normalised violence was, how secluded some of these communities were and yet how interwoven they were. So everyone knew everyone's business, everyone knew who beat their wife, everyone knew who probably murdered their wife. But it talks about these three big seminal cases of women who were murdered. It started this wave of reporting and this movement against what they classed as femicide, which was the murder of a woman for being a woman, um, especially a young woman. And it talked about how there were silent vigils and there were mass walks and how very little palpably changed. <laughs> and this was in the 80s. Nothing changes. I am frightened. Um, and what also made me think about a lot was the fact that um, there are no men in my life. I've got a granddad and uncle's who I love dearly and who I see a lot. And you know, I, they are part of my life. But, but other than that, I have got two male friends who absolutely balk at toxic masculinity. So kind of concepts of masculinity and the fragility of masculinity have absolutely no impact on my life. How lucky I am to have found myself in a group of women and their thems and queers who just do not accept that kind of shit and the fact that I'm existing in a time and place where that's possible. Like, incredible. 4.75 stars because I was frightened. So next I think I'm going to read Molly Willows by Sylvia Townsend Warner. It's such a short book guys such a short book bonsoir <laughs> into the next night um i just finished reading lolly willows 
put it down somewhere and immediately I've lost it again. What is the curse of this book going missing? Um, what didn't go missing though was the plot. Five stars, top ten books of all time. Like I knew, I knew if I could push through into this book, I would love it. Right, plot, plot Lauren. So it was about a lady who had ended up basically being a bit of a ghost caring for a dad, moving in with a brother's family when a dad passed to look after their children, never really establishing a life of her own and everyone took for granted that she was there to help them. One day, a good two thirds of the way through the book, she announces that she's taken herself off to this village she's found on the map and she's going to set up shop there um, and she's going to live her best life and that's exactly what she does once they actually allow her to go, like bodily autonomy who? Um, and she's renting a cottage, she's ambling around, she's meeting the shopkeepers. She thinks that, you know, it's a bit weird that everyone in the town seems to like never go to bed and like, like out singing in the middle of the night, that's weird. Um, but like doesn't think much beyond that. Uh, but then one of her nephews, who was her greatest supporter in her escape in London, comes to visit her and takes a liking to the village. Um, and he moves in as well and it's just so interesting how she isn't Laura anymore she's Aunt Lolly again and like her whole identity is taken from her and no one understands why she's upset about that um, so long story short she calls up the devil one night <laughs> like it takes such a turn from like a normal classic into like paranormal um, and the devil's like well do you want him dead and she's like nah I just want him out of my village um, and it's just about her becoming a satanist witch and satan is kind of depicted as a gardener <laughs> just like a groundskeeper um and is this really protective figure who kind of just like drapes an arm round her like a shawl um and just opens up freedom of the countryside to her and she goes to bacchanals <laughs> like at sabbath parties and honestly the last third just absolutely snapped it was amazing uh, so honestly I don't know what we can follow that with but I'm gonna try and read Blood and Guts in High School which is a modern classic um, but apparently like a cult classic a punk classic um, and I'm really hoping we can roll with it like this because one of my new favourite books ever. That's unreal to me. That's crazy. No. No, never mind. Never mind. Incest. No. So I thought, oh, let's have a little aesthetic moment. Maybe we can read in the bath. Um, page 12 I got to, and I think the book didn't actually start until, like, page 7. So... <laughs> Um, yeah, high school girl, hence the high school, um, fucking her dad. And I think it really means a biological dad, unless I'm being really stupid. Um, but also, I don't really want to find out. I don't want to find out. Um, and it's filled with very rude drawings. And it feels like it's just... I like such a prude. It feels like it is a shock tactic. Like, it doesn't say anything other than the crudeness. I mean, I'm 12 pages in, so, like, how can I judge? But, at least at the beginning, I don't feel like there was any substance to balance it with. And I know I could power through and read this, but that's not what this year is about. I'm going to be doing nothing left, right and centre. Um, and I don't want to waste my time with this. It was awful. It was, it was bad. So, um, yeah, good job I brought in the next possibility because I've still got a couple of hours before bed um, I'm really hoping we can pull this back around because I don't want to end this vlog on like a negative note so we're going to read Federico Falco's Perfect Cemetery translated by Jennifer Croft because surely the one person who's not going to let me down is a charcoal press book surely hello we're back in the spinny chair I've discovered I like to kind of just repetitively while I read and the squeak is very annoying for everybody else so good news 
it was a lot better than Blood and Guts in high school. Woof. Um, other good news, I actually finished it. Unfortunately, it was a short story collection. Um, I'm not sure if I knew it was a short story collection, to be honest. Um, and it was really quite a lot about religion, um, which, you know, a lot of these South American texts clearly are going to have religion as a theme. Um, they are a lot more religious of a culture than we are in England. There was a short story about a girl fancying a Mormon. There was a short story about a man designing uh, cemeteries. As ever when I read short stories, I just feel like I'm too stupid to really understand what the point was. Um, I mean, it was it was lovely. Will it stay with me? Probably not. Did I enjoy my time? Sure. But I feel like short stories are trying to say something and I never really understand what that is. So it feels like a bit of a weird place to end this vlog. <laughs> Overall, I am really glad I did this challenge. I think I've had a lovely start to the year in terms of my reading. I've already read 10 books and we're like not even a week into the year. I got to read loads of the charcoal classics that I've been storing up for ages that I really wanted to get to. Um, I have set my standard for DNF and books that don't bring me joy this year. I have read some classics, some diverse stuff, some non-fiction that I really enjoyed and I've got a brand new favourite fiction book, like top 10. Lolly Willows was absolutely impeccable. And I'd love to know how much of a strong or slow start you got off to with your reading year because sometimes I think we put too much stock in this but also I'm feeding into it with this video. So, you know, read some good books. Um, make sure you stay hydrated, moisturise, and I'll see you later. Love ya!